it was just a sad situation and I just felt like a failure because, you know, I couldn't make it. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I, I was in a city that I wasn't familiar with, that I didn't know anybody in. I had no friends, no relatives here in this place anyway. Pacific Garden Mission, founded in 1877, is one of the oldest rescue missions in the United States of America. But what's so interesting is the stories of how people come here. Started in the city of Chicago, we have now become an international ministry. Through Unshackled, through our television program, God has reached people all over the world through this location here in Chicago. But the stories are amazing of how people come here. Yes, people from the city of Chicago come here and find Jesus Christ, but people all throughout the world. I can stand here and tell you various stories. What we want to do in this next hour is have you listen to the stories of people that have found their way through other parts of this nation to Pacific Garden Mission. Thank you for watching. God bless you as we welcome you to Pacific Garden Mission. Yes, Pastor Phil mentioned that people come from all over the nation to Pacific Garden Mission. As a matter of fact, we're here in Chicago where we see over 50 million tourists each year filling the sidewalks with smiles and things to do, dreams and aspirations, pictures to take, and to share memories when they get back home. However, and that's not the case with everyone who comes to the mission. We have three stories today we want to share with you, compelling stories, compelling testimonies of life transformed by Jesus Christ. These three men came to Pacific Garden Mission what they thought was by mistake, but it was by God's plan. When you hear their testimonies, I think you'll agree. These stories are amazing. Our first testimony is about a young man named Christian. He had dreams in Georgia of coming to a land of opportunity. However, after he traveled over 700 miles, he found himself sleeping in parks, not knowing what to do, unable to find a job, and finding himself in the hands of Catholic Charities who brought him to Pacific Garden Mission. Enjoy his testimony because he's now part of our family. I was struggling with quite a lot of things. Um, I had rebellious problems. You know, I wasn't doing well in school and so on and so forth. You know, just typical growing pains going through the, going through from teenagehood to adulthood and I was struggling with a lot of uh, things such as getting a job and so on and so forth. I was also not getting along with my parents. One day uh, I had an argument after an argument with my parents I just decided that it was time for me to leave. I didn't want to be at home and doing nothing with my life. I wanted to do something with my life you know I wanted to go out there see the world and make something of myself so one night, without telling my folks, I packed my bags up, I cleaned out my room, I left home, and I went to the nearest train station where I boarded a train to Chicago. Once I arrived in Chicago, my first goal was to go to Job Corps, which is a vocational school that teaches uh, kids how to, in a specific job trade, and how to get jobs, and so on and so forth. So with that, I went over to, the, to their facility, but unfortunately, um, I didn't think things through. I didn't have all my documents when I left home. And um, I ended up being stranded out in the streets in Chicago. Now, being from the, being from the country, it's a huge change being uh, from trees and nature to being around a cityscape with so many traffic and people. It was just a sad situation, and I just felt like a failure because, you know, I couldn't make it. I pretty much just wandered the streets uh, doing my best to see if I could find a job, maybe somewhere. But unfortunately, it didn't work out so well because I didn't have very many credentials. The job market is very tough here in Chicago, especially for someone who has um, very little job experience in offices and so on and so forth. So from there, um, a group of people found me on the streets, then led me here to the mission. 
And after sleeping in the parks here in Chicago, it was a blessing just to be able to receive a bed and receive a free meal here. So, you know, I just praise God for being able to be led here. And now two weeks after I ended up here at the mission, I joined the men's Bible program. Because um, after seeing people walking around the building with their shirts and ties and on, it looked like they got their lives together. I just decided it was time for me to get more to get more discipline in my life, you know, and not to be so rebellious. When I first got here to the mission, um, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, all my life, I just came out of high school maybe around a year ago. So um, it was just a complete change for me. And I was very prideful back then. Um, back then, I didn't see myself as homeless. Uh, I thought, I thought, look at all these homeless people, you know, I shouldn't be here and so on and so forth. So when I joined the men's Bible program, my original intent was just to get a GED and in preparation for joining the Navy. But as I went through the program, I noticed how so many lives were being changed, how people were um, giving their lives over, the, over to Christ. And um, that just really touched me, you know. And it made me realize that, you know, if I don't shape up, I might end up being more like them. I could end up in their situation. So uh, right then and there, I decided, you know, just to receive Jesus Christ here at the missions, you know. And since then, it's been a very big change in my life. Um, since then, I've gotten in touch with my folks. I'm talking more regularly with them. And they're uh, actually very proud of me for actually being on the men's Bible program, you know. And I just have Christ to thank for that. Because without them, um, I would just be on the streets with nowhere to go. You know, without them, I wouldn't really be anything. So in my time here at the mission, um, he's given me a new lease on life. I've actually managed to get my GED here, which is a very big blessing and a very big step for me because I never thought I'd actually be able to get a degree in, of sorts in education. You know, I was doing very well in school. So I just praise God for that, to be able to have a change of life. God is blessed with the job here at the mission as well. I get to work in hospitality as well. Um, I get to work with the diverse clientele here. And it also just gives me the chance to really share the gospel with all of our guests here as well. You know, it's been a blessing to not only share uh, what Christ has done for me, but to also be able to help minister to the people here as well. You know, that's been a great blessing as well. And I just thank God for that as well. When you visit Pacific Garden Mission, you'll be greeted by Christian, who now serves in hospitality here. Our next story is about Gary, who came through Chicago on a vacation and was stuck here. When you hear his testimony, you'll understand why he stayed. came to the Pacific Garden Mission on February 14th of this year. And uh, I came an odd way. I didn't come through any means of myself um, because that this was the farthest thing from my mind. Um, I was on vacation and I was passing through Chicago. Uh, the bus uh, that I was on broke down. I lost my ticket. Uh, the ticket couldn't be reissued because I was wiped out of the system. Um, like I never existed, like that life was gone for me. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I, I was in a city that I wasn't familiar with, that I didn't know anybody in. I had no friends, no relatives here in this place anyway. And one of the security officers at the Greyhound Station said, there's a, there's a place that you might want to check out over on Canal, and it's called the Pacific Garden Mission. And uh, I started to walk. It was very cold that day. It was snowing, and um, just I wasn't even dressed for the weather, really. So um, I walked as quickly as I could, and it seemed like I walked forever. It seemed like I kept walking and walking and walking until there was no end. And so when I got here, I looked and I said, this can't be a shelter. Are you kidding me? It looks like a college. <laughs> it's, it's huge. It's a big campus. And so I walked in the door and uh, I looked around and I was just amazed. And everyone was so friendly and everyone was so welcoming and warming. Uh, and just I felt the love of Christ um, that I was that I wasn't even looking for, but it just happened to be there. And so when I when I felt that, I felt comfortable. Um, 
I, joining the Bible program at that time was the farthest thing from my mind. I was wanting to leave, get my ticket straightened out and go back home. And so I was going back to California, but something held me here and that had be the grace of God. And you know, I had strayed away from God for a long time. I got saved when I was probably 13 years old. The, uh, the fact was that I had denied who God was and I, I even th said God wasn't real. God couldn't be real because if he was, then things wouldn't be happening in the world around us and I wouldn't be here today if God was who he said he was. And so when um, uh, one of the guys told me, you should join the Bible program. And I was like, a Bible program? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I don't want to join the Bible program. I want to go home. And so um, that kind of sat there with me for a little bit. And so I spent Saturday night and Sunday night as an overnight guest. And on Monday morning when I woke up, I was getting ready to walk out and go back home and, and leave the place. And as I got to the door, I turned and I looked and I just burst into tears and I couldn't understand why. And I was like, what, what's happening here? Something's, something's happening. I'm feeling warm inside and something's leading me to stay here. And so I decided that I would give that Bible program a try. I wound up on the Bible program. I started out as a third floor worker, just a dorm crew person, uh, doing wake up calls, waking up the guys, making sure the dorm was in order. It was, it was a great job. Um, and then one day I got a phone call and said, guess what, you're going to mailing services. And so I said, mailing services? Um, I, at that time I was, you know, felt, I wasn't feeling great about that, but you know, God places those places for a reason. And he put me down there and amazing things started to happen. I got to witness to guys. I got to, and people don't think that you can do those things just by giving somebody a piece of mail. But when someone's expecting something like an ID card or a social security card, and you get the chance to give that to them and say, God bless you and say, amen. And they, they see that difference in you, that something's changed and there's, there's something different about you. They want to ask questions. They want to know who God is and that God can save us to the uttermost. You know, I, I struggled my entire life with sexual perversions and, and different things. And, you know, I know God can deliver anything and anybody and God can reach down and pull us out of the deepest, darkest places and take us to higher, higher standards. And you know, I, I never realized that coming to, to the Pacific Guard mission would change my life so dramatically. But I, I realized that God sometimes has to captivate us and hold us down and keep us from moving forward um, in order to get that closer walk with God. It's not that I wasn't still saved, but I fell out of fellowship with God because you know you can't lose something that you already got that God died for us on the cross. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And, but you can walk out of that fellowship and, st and you know, not have that relationship with God that you once had and, and draw yourself further away. But um, the thing is that no matter how far you go away, no matter where you run to, God is always there. He's everywhere and he knows everything. And it's, it's definitely a blessing for me to be able to be here and give my testimony and say what God's done in my life because if God can save me, he can save anybody. My 60 day commitment to God um, is not just a 60 day commitment, it's a lifetime commitment. And no matter what I sign on a piece of paper, I know that my walk with God will continue once I leave the Pacific Guard mission and once I uh, step out into the world and can give my testimony and say, God can save you. Don't think that he can't because there's times that I thought there's no way that there can't be anything out there. It's a void. But God filled that void and he filled my soul and my spirit. Jesus Christ, because he is the one and the answer to anything that we're going through. And Jesus can heal. Jesus can save. Gary learned that Jesus takes adversity and turns it into an opportunity. Life transforming opportunity is in the hands of Jesus Christ. We see that all the time here. Many of you are familiar with our radio drama, Unshackled, which is aired globally, as Pastor Phil mentioned in our introduction. James heard Unshackled in Louisiana. He heard it many times. He heard Unshackled, the radio drama, talk about men and women who have received help at Pacific Garden Mission. He decided to come here. This is an amazing story of how God led James to Pacific Garden Mission and his healing works in his life. I was raised in a single mother uh, household. Um, whenever I was uh, young, my mom tried her best to protect me and raise me in, in church. And about the age of three to five years old, I was um, actually sexually molested by uh, one of her best friends and also a family member. Um, and growing up in church, um, I was taught the Christian morals and the more right than wrong. 
being the fact that I grew up in church, when I started growing rebellious, I uh, grew rebellious against God, against mom. I started stealing uh, from church. I started stealing from friends. I started stealing from stores. Started breaking into houses and eventually it led me uh, to go into prison. And once I was in prison, um, I actually noticed immediately that thieves weren't looked too kindly on because thieves were starting to, I was seeing guys stealing from others and they were getting beat up. And um, and so it opened my eyes immediately that I need to stop stealing, otherwise I, I'll take the chance of also uh, having the same consequence. And um, I spent three years in prison and wound up uh, being released on parole, spent four years on parole. After I got out, I texted my mom, my sister, and thanked them for their prayers over the years and and that I haven't given my life over to Christ, but, I mean, he's working on me. And uh, so finally, after, my, after talking to my sister for a while, I, I told her to come pick me up for church the next day. And uh, so November 23rd, Sunday morning, she brought me to church. I'm sitting in the, in the service. The entire service is about me. The message is about me. I'm crying the entire time. At the end of the service, they open up the altar for altar call, and I didn't, there was no weight on me. It's like I was thrown up out of my chair, and I ran towards the altar, and uh, of course, still crying, and gave my life, uh, committed my life to Jesus Christ. And, and so I wound up selling, selling all that I had, um, as it says in Luke 12:33 says sell all that you have and give alms so uh i sold all that i have i bought the train ticket and gave the rest of the the remaining money over to offerings and came here and uh walked into the front door was introduced was uh greeted by james taylor and i explained to him my situation and he asked me said well did you know about the bible program here so to be honest with you, the only thing I, I know about Pacific Garden Mission is they do unshackled and they take care of the homeless. And he said, well, well, we have a Bible program and and he explained the program. And so right away, I, I knew this is where God wanted me to be. And we went into the office and as he's uh, explaining the the program to me, he hands me the two folders, and the first folder that's right there on top said Pastor Percy Stronghold Class, and then it just clicked. It said Spiritual Addiction Stronghold Class. I'm like, so I, I was crying in the office, and uh, and so um, they asked me if I was all right. I said, yeah, I'm all right. I, I'm just, I just know where I'm, I'm where God wants me to be right now. And since I've been here, God showed me a, a tremendous amount about myself, about my upbringing, about how to love myself, but also love other men um, as God loves us. Because I had a hatred for myself, so if I hated myself, how am I going to hate love anybody else? So he's been growing me and his word and his will, showing me his will for my life. And it's just been awesome since I've been here. It's, it hasn't been 100% hunky-dory, but I mean, his word says a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. And I've fallen since I've been here, but thank the Lord, there's, there, through his strength and the, the prayers of my brothers around me, I'll get back up. So. Amen. <laughs>
It's amazing what Jesus Christ is doing here at Pacific Garden Mission. Jesus Christ has made this place an opportunity, a nutritive soil to help people get better, to change their lives with the Word of God. It's the same Word of God that the mission was founded on in 1877. Yes, that same Word of God is changing lives every day here at Pacific Garden Mission. We value your support. We pray that someone out there would join us in prayer for the men who are gonna walk through the door today, for those who have not come to the mission yet, and for those who are at the mission. Also, if you're in Chicago and you'd like to come in and volunteer, there's many things you can do here as a volunteer at Pacific Garden Mission. Also, we would love to have your financial support. Sometimes we have 1,000 to 1,200 people in the building every night and we accept no state or government funding. Everything is done through the kind hearts of those watching and listening to our programs. Those are the friends of the mission here in Chicago that support us financially. We pray that you'll come alongside of us. You'll see a number on your screen and a website. You can go to our secure website and donate financially. When you give to the mission, you're actually giving through the mission to those who need it the most. Those people who come in to our doors, why don't you get behind some of the folks who are here at the mission and support them so that they can become fully functioning followers of Christ. What a blessing that will be. We thank you for viewing this show and may God bless you. We're now going to turn to the auditorium and watch Pastor Phil preach a sermon on how to find God's will for our lives. We've been looking at the book of Joshua, where Joshua is a book of victory. And remember a few weeks ago I made the statement that the goal of the deliverance from the land of Egypt was not just to get out of Egypt, but it was to go into the promised land. And, and I liken that to many Christians. For, for some of us, the goal is just to get saved. Remember, it's not just about getting saved. It's not just about stopping certain behaviors. To will, if I just stop using drugs, if I just stop being promiscuous, if I just stop this. The goal is Christ-likeness, and the goal, the goal is a victorious Christian life that God has for you, it is so much more than just getting out of Egypt. Now, what we're going to look at tonight in Joshua chapter 3 is really the culmination of what they've been waiting for. From the time they left Egypt, they were promised, they were told about a land that floweth full of milk and honey, and this is the land. They were told that they were going to go into a place of absolute rest, of absolute blessing where God was going to do the work while they marched forward, and now the day is here. Look if you would to chapter 3, verse 1. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. What I like about this there, before they got God's direction about what to do, in verse 2, it still took them a period of time of three days. Sometimes, listen to me tonight, what we need to do before we move forward is just stop and examine where we are at and ask where we are going. That's why many of you are, are in a good place right now. God has brought you in a situation, in a circumstance in your life where you can actually sit and ask some of the questions. You can look back and see some of the mistakes. You can see where you are at right now. And you can look and plan towards the future of where God wants you to go. And now for three days they waited here, but look in verse 3. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenants of the Lord your God. Now the ark represented the presence of Almighty God. When they were to build the, the tabernacle and later on the temple, they had the Holy of Holies. And this is where the ark of the covenant dwelt. But, but he's saying there, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. So you are to wait upon the direction of, of Almighty God, verse 4. And yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. 
Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way before. So he says again, I like that though, you need to wait until you see the Ark of the Covenant, where it's going, and it says that ye may know the way you must go. I believe it's absolutely important that we follow the will of God for our lives. And that's what he's saying there. You need to wait and see the direction that the ark of God is going. So many people get outside of the will of God and their life becomes an absolute mess. Who is the person that God wants you to marry and be with? What vocation does God want you to have? And when God wants you at a certain vocation, how long does God want you to say? Well, what's your next move in life? What's the direction you ought to go? What you need to do is wait until God makes it clear because when you get ahead of God, things become an awful mess. But remember, when you are in the center of the will of God, there is nothing that man can do to you. Absolutely nothing. You know, I was reading a story... In 1692, a, a, a man by the name of Louis Gladly was a man from France who came to Jamaica seeking religious freedom. Well, and he was there in Jamaica, and there was a violent earthquake. The earthquake took him underneath the ground, and he was sucked in for a period of time, but he was absolutely conscious. He knew what was going on. At that point, he just prayed and asked the will of God to be done. Soon there was an eruption. And it's a true story. He was flung up into the air and over the ocean and landed in the ocean where he swam to a swimming vessel and he was absolutely saved and he was absolutely perfectly well. It's interesting, this man lived uh, till 1739 and for 47 years after that experience, he told everybody about it. The point is, when you are right where God wants you to be, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they can heat the furnace seven times greater. When you are where God wants you to be, you can be like Daniel in the middle of a lion's den. When you are where God wants you to be, you can like be Peter in prison. But it doesn't matter what anybody can do to you because you are on the center of the will of Almighty God. These people were going into a land of giants and walled cities and warriors and chariots and spears. But Joshua said, wait until you see the ark of God move. That's the way that you need, that you know that you have to go. How many of us really are waiting on the will of God for our lives? Are we really seeking God? Are we asking God about his direction, about who we should be with? where we should go, how long we should be there. And this story over here was talking about that. You know, I was thinking about this as I was reading the story this week, about comparing the success of this generation with the failure of the last. Remember 40 years earlier, their fathers came to the same situation? They sent in 12 spies, 10 of them brought back an evil report, and they did not go in. Why was it that this generation was successful? Well, I believed again, number one, they followed God's direction. God said, go. Uh, but I also believe is sometimes when we look at ourselves, the previous generation focused upon their limitations. They were told how big the warriors were how high the walled cities were, how many of them were there. they are giants in the land. And then they looked at themselves, not really realizing God told them that the land was there. And what some of us do, like their forefathers did, is we focus on our limitations. As I said, where God guides, He provides. If God calls, He equips. If God is going to call you to a particular ministry, into a particular situation, God is going to equip you to do the job that he called you to do. If God wants you to live a certain life, God's not going to say, yes, I want you to live victoriously. Oh, that's right, but you can't do that. I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but not you. 
you see? And what some of us do is like their forefathers. That's why I like this generation. They just said, follow where God said to go, and they just went. Did you ever see the zeal of a new convert, somebody who comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ? They're not constrained by limitations. They're not constrained about what they can't do. They just take God at his word. If God said it, I believe it, and that's good enough for me. If God said I can be clean, I can be clean. If God said I can live victoriously, I can live victoriously. If God said that, I'm just going to do it. Oh, but their forefathers, uh, they're tall. I don't know. We're not warriors. You know, the cities are... Another thing I was uh, thinking of is... They, they struggle, their forefathers, because I believe of their own desires. Their parents really wanted to go back to Egypt the whole time. They kept rehearsing that. Remember in Egypt, the leeks and the onions, remember Egypt. And I believe a, a, one of the reasons a lot of people fail to live a victorious Christian life is plain and simple. We don't want to. We, we might not like the consequences of some of our actions, but we really don't want to go forward because Egypt wasn't that bad. One of my favorite verses, Philippians 3.13, where the Apostle Paul said, This one thing I will do, forgetting those things which are what? Think about that verse for a minute. Forgetting those things which are behind. The Apostle Paul said, One of the secrets of my success here was a man who was involved in seeing Christians persecuted, who had houses broken up, who was arresting people, seeing them slaughtered. When Stephen was being stoned, he was standing there with approval and his, his, his garment was splattered with the blood of Stephen. Paul, how can you go forward? How can you allow God to use you? How? This one thing I will do. Forgetting those things which are behind. And what some of you need to do tonight is forget those things which are behind. Their forefathers continued to look back to Egypt and they could never really break that pattern and they did not live victoriously. But this generation knew only the wilderness they didn't know about the leeks and the garlics and they just wanted to go in this one thing I will do let's be real tonight some of us tonight need to forget I often say it where Satan many times will highlight the past and minimize the pain and my friend it wasn't very nice God is calling you tonight to a higher life a life of victory. He's telling you to cross the Jordan. Their forefathers failed. Why? They focused on their limitations. They focused on their desires about Egypt. Another thing is I was thinking about when the ten spies came back. What did the ten spies do? What did they do? Did they give a positive report? They spoke negatively. And listen to this. There's some of us, and I don't care if it's church, when somebody, before somebody gets saved, people criticize them. Man, that guy's a drunk. Even here, people will, the same people that may be discouraging you now because you're trying to change your life, whether you're in the New Day program, the New Life program, whether you're here visiting, whatever it is, people are going to criticize you the way you lived before and the fact that you made a step forward, those same people are still going to criticize you. Man, he's a crackhead. That guy's no good. And now that you're trying, who does that guy think he is wearing a suit? Man, they ain't going to do nothing for him. They, they don't know nothing. I have one question. Where do you go the first of the month? Ask that question to the person giving you advice about how you are to live your life. I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to give you advice, how you should be counseled, how you should be dealt with, how you should be talked to. And they got a blister on their lip. You know, they, they, they want to stand and wax eloquent and, and tell everybody, man, this is how they should run the program. They don't do this right then. And again, as I said earlier, the first of the month, I don't see them for three days.
how can you really advise somebody on how to change your life? The point is, be careful who you listen to. You see, that's why... That's why their forefathers failed, because they listened to the wrong people. It was only Joshua and Caleb that said, let us go for The other ten said, we can't do this, and their forefathers listened to them. And so therefore, Joshua now sent only two spies instead of twelve, because I find that interesting. Joshua was one of the original two, and they came back, the two spies, with a great story. We saw last week how they met Rahab in they were encouraged and they knew that the nations were afraid that they were going to be victorious so they came back with a positive report and therefore as we're going to see they can cross over the Jordan but again my friend I can't emphasize enough who do you listen to I hear people all week with all sorts of advice you know you know how it is in, in sports people that have never played don't know anything they'll give everybody advice Man, what I would do if I was doing a crossover. Man, you can't do no crossover. Stop. Stop. Don't talk. Shh. Right? And you let people want to give all sorts of advice. You know, you're carrying your Bible and you're doing this and you're, you're, you're trying to change. Praise God for somebody trying to change their life. Hallelujah. 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 I praise God for every man here, every woman here, every individual that has stepped forward, that said, God, I want to try to change my life. Hallelujah. Sometimes there's enough people trying to beat people down, trying to give advice, telling you how you can't make it, how you made the wrong decision, how they're not doing it right. Well, then you tell me how to do it. Tell me through your example what you've learned and how you've lived victorious. They can't do that. Listening to negative talk. Again, be careful who you listen to. You filter what they say through their lifestyle. When you hear them talking, see how they're living. That's all I got to ask you. This week, you'll hear many wise sages. Many people will wax eloquent and poetic about programs they were involved in, about people they know. Look at their lifestyle and view what they say through that prism. I am going forward by the grace of God. Amen. <laughs> direction. Direction. Now look, if you would, to verse 5. Not only direction as we see them about to enter into the promised land. I like this here, consecration. Look at verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So here he says, Before the Lord is going to do wonders amongst them, they needed to do something there in verse 5, and that was what? Sanctify, Sanctify themselves. That word is set apart. That's a word of consecration. You know, I, I think for many of us, remember, spiritual preparation was needed, not military expertise. Joshua didn't say, God's going to do wonders amongst you. You need to go out there and sharpen your swords. You need to go out there and, and sit down and work on your military tactics. You, we need to come up with a plan on how to attack Jericho and how to defeat the army. If you want God to do wonders among you, you need to sanctify, sanctify yourself. And you see, there's some of us, we've been saved, but boy, we have a lot of baggage. Yeah. And, and I do believe what God wants us to do is stop in our lives where we're at in this moment, sanctify ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves in our heart. We need to ask ourselves, is there any unconfessed sin I've committed? You, you know, I think of David. Let me read to you from Psalm 32. Psalm 32, uh, this is after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And listen to what he said. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. So David said, before I confessed my sin, my bones waxed old. He just felt like an old man. 
he woke up and it was just, ah. Uh. What I see here is a man who's probably feeling depressed. You know, a lot of times we'll look for all these causes, but the real cause is spiritual. And he, said, and he goes on and he says there, For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer, say lie. I'm not feeling very good right now, but then what he says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. It's until I confessed. And some of us need to get alone with a holy God, and we need to deal with the issues of our past. Yes. Yeah. As I said a few moments ago when the Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. But what we need to do with those things which are behind, we need to first come to grips with them. Amen. We need to confess them and deal with them. We're really not going to cross over Jordan into a victorious land if we still deal with the issues. What happened when I was four? What my mother did to me, what my father did to me, what my cousin did to me about this situation. We can say, well, we've heard things similar to this, but the question is, what have you done about it? In order for you to go over Jordan, if you want God to do wondrous things amongst you, first thing you got to do, sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. Holiness unto God. And what we need to do is confess my sin. God, I have been this. I have done this. This is who I have been, and by the grace of God, tonight I want to give it to Jesus Christ. Again, it's not just about coming out of Egypt. Oh, they came out of a land of Egypt. They went through a wilderness, and they're about to go into victory where God was going to give them abundant blessing, and he was going to work mighty wonders amongst them. But beforehand, sanctify yourself. Get alone with God. One of my favorite sections of Scripture, and I, I believe this means so much to the Christian, it's the story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 18. Some of us have heard this parable before about the one individual that was forgiven a, a great debt, and then he went out and saw another man that owed him a little, and he had him arrested. And I, I like what Jesus says in Matthew 8, 30, 18, 34. His Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. You know, I often thought about that term, and here's a man that chose not to forgive somebody else, and he was delivered over to who? Torment. Tormentors. I want to ask some of you tonight, how many of you are living in a prison of your own creation, you're being torn and tormented by events of the past, by things that people have done to you, that you refuse to let go. If you want to cross the River Jordan and enter into that land of victory, if you want God to do marvelous things amongst you, you need to stop talking and dealing with what your brother did to you, what your mother did to you, how you weren't raised right, or about how this situation happened. Because Jesus said, when you choose not to forgive, you are handed over to somebody, and that's the tormentors. You live just a tormented life. Yeah. And that's why I think uh, 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath what? Torment. Torment. Some of us live in fear, and if you're asking what is the solution to fear, the solution to fear is forgiveness because fear has torment. And why do I have the torment? Is because Matthew chapter 18 says the man who did not forgive was handed over to the tormentors. Maybe the reason I live in fear of tomorrow, fear of the next decision I make, fear of this and fear of that. Some of you live in absolute fear, a prison of your own making, and it could be as simple as this. What you need to do is come to grips with the past. Some of these issues that happened to you were absolutely wrong and not to be justified, but by the grace of God, he forgave you of the things you have done, so you need to forgive somebody else. And my point is, in order for you to move forward, maybe that's why you're being hindered today. You wonder, why am I being hindered? Why can't I go forward? Well, maybe I've never truly confessed my sin. Maybe I really enjoy it. 
I've really never, confessing the sin means saying the same thing that God says. Maybe I've never really dealt with it. Maybe I've never really forgiven somebody. Maybe I've never really come into a position in my life where I've dealt with my past. Again, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. If you want to go forward tonight, if you want to enter into that land of blessing, you want to go across the River Jordan, you want God to do wondrous things in your life, sanctify yourself. He said, we are not moving forward. Some of you are haunted by the demons of your past, and you refuse to move forward in the future because you continue to be defined by events that happened many years ago. You know what the reality is? None of us had perfect parents. Get over it. None, I was raised by two sinners who were raised by two sinners. I'm a sinner raising my own children. That cannot be an excuse no matter what happened to you. What I need to do is go to the foot of the cross and forgive whatever wrongs I feel may have been done to me and let it go by the grace of Almighty God. Stop that right now. We hear the same story, you, you rehash the same story in, in our minds, some of us, time and time again. We, we go to bed with the same story, we talk about the same story. Sanctify yourself. Look if you would in verse 6, look if you would in verse 6. And Joshua was spake to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord God said unto Joshua, This day I will begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. The last point is obstruction. There was a problem here. Look down in verse 15. Look at the last section of verse 15, the parentheses there. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest. The time that God brought them to the river Jordan wasn't a time that it was a little stream in the middle of the summer. It was a time in the spring when the mountains of Mount Hermon, the, the snow was melting, and the river Jordan was wide and it overflowed the banks. And yet that's where God brought them? Do you see that there? Sometimes God will bring you to an impossible situation where there is an obstruction to see what you will do. And I believe if I followed the will of God in terms of his direction, if, if the Ark of the Covenant led me right here, if this is where God wants me to be, if I've sanctified and I've prayed and I've confessed my sin and I've forgiven those who have wronged me, and if I've done that, I don't care how wide the river is, I don't care how deep the river is, that's what God has always done to his people. He has brought them to the precipice of an impossible situation to see what they will do see what they will do. Some of you are, are looking at your situation right now and it seems to be absolutely impossible. God wants to see what you're going to do. The Jordan overfloweth. He didn't bring them there when there was a trickle. He brought them there when there was a torrent of rushing water. Look at verse 15 again. And, the, and as they that bear the ark were coming to the Jordan, the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the water. What I like about this, not only was there a problem between blessing and them was an impossible situation. You know, some of you see that tonight. Between God's real blessing and the wondrous works he wants to do, there's an impossible situation in your life. And God tells them, go forward. You see, and that's what I like about this story here, and I do believe this. If you do what you can do, I believe God will do what you can't. But the point is you need to go forward. When Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave, he told the people before he did that, he told the people to move the stone. My thought is if you're going to raise a dead man, why can't you move the stone? You know why? Because you can do that. 
When Lazarus was standing there, he told them to remove his grave cloth. Well, why, Jesus, didn't you just zap it down? If you raised up a dead guy, why don't you? Because you can do that. The point is when you can do the things that you can, God will do the things that you can't. You'll never go forward in your life while you're just sitting. Houses just don't pop up. Hey, look, there's one. Jobs just don't come floating down. Wait, let me catch. There's over here. Look. Things you need to move forward. God, what direction am I going? I'm following your will. The ark is going this way. I, I, I've confessed my sins. I've forgiven those who've wronged me. It's an impossible situation. But you called me. You're going to equip me. I'm still going to go forward. Hallelujah. Anyway, he wants you to go forward. Don't stop. And, 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 and look, look, look what happens over here in verse uh, 16. That the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon the heap uh, very far from the city Adam, that is besides Zatan, and those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. They would have never seen the miracle if they did not first go forward and follow God's direction. And some of you will never see a miracle if you don't first follow God's will, sanctify, deal with those issues, look at that obstruction, and go forward anyway. Because we serve a God that can part a Red Sea. We serve a God who can walk on the water. We serve a God who can feed the multitude in the wilderness. We serve a God who can protect his people in the middle of a furnace. We serve a God that can do wondrous things. But as for me and you, we need to go forward by the grace of God. My friend, as you're here tonight, as we close, I want to ask you, God didn't just save you. God has so much more for you. What do you need to do? Find out what, what is God's will for your life? What direction should you go? How do I get this victory? You need to sanctify. There's some things I need to confess. I'm not saying publicly, whether you want to pray with somebody, confess it, but you need to get that garbage out. Some of you need to forgive some people from the past. It's gone. It's over. And what do you need to do when you face this obstruction? You need to go forward believing that God will do what you can't as long as you do what you can. Yeah. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed as we close the service tonight. If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the pastor, I want to make that decision tonight. I want to get saved, and that's what it's about. The Bible says we're all sinners. And as sinners, we deserve the same fate. The wages of sin is death. But if you want to make that decision tonight by taking a step of faith, say, I need to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to get saved. I didn't ask if you want to be religious. Do you want to join a church? Do you, do you want, no, do you want to know if you die that your sins are pardoned by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Some of you need to make that decision. My, use my wife's saved. It doesn't make it for you. You need to get saved. That's you tonight. Raise up your hand. I want to pray. I need to my, have my sins forgiven. Hallelujah. Right, raise it up high and hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Father God, I pray for those that have raised their hands. God, you have so much more in the land of promise. And I pray that they would take the first step tonight by coming to know you as Savior. Bless them, strengthen them, and encourage them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard the stories of changed lives. You've heard the message about Joshua. And what it took for Joshua and the Israelites to enter into the promised land was faith. I always find it ironic that Moses, who was representative of the law, did not lead the children of Israel into the promised land, but it was Joshua. And today, as we look at salvation, we think it's not the law that leads us to salvation, it's faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend one point is guilty of all. Now think on that verse for a moment. If I would ask you, most of us would say, how would you get to heaven? We would say, well, I've, I didn't kill anybody. I'm a pretty good person. I, I didn't do this or that. We, we try to come up with some type of law keeping. But think about that verse. 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend one point is guilty of all. I may not have murdered, but I have lied, so therefore I am just as guilty. So law cannot give me salvation. Law cannot lead me to victory. Moses could not lead the children of Israel into the promised land. It had to be by faith. The way they were to conquer the, those giants was by faith. And the Bible says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The reason God gave us the law wasn't to save us by it, but to show us what we were, that we needed saving. How would I know that I needed a savior if I didn't realize I was first a sinner? What told me I was a sinner? The law. I couldn't even covet in the law. But the good news today is Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you by faith receive him as your savior, God offers you a pardon and eternal life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want that everlasting life, what you need to do is make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your savior. Realizing law cannot lead me to victory, law can't save me, I need a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that decision, we encourage you to make it right now. Pray with me, bow your head, ask Jesus Christ to come in. Say something simple, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a savior. This moment I pray to receive Jesus Christ as my personal savior. If you pray that, write us, let us know. We are encouraged by your letters, but remember the most important decision you need to make is what you will do with eternity. God gave his son Jesus Christ to die for your sin. Thank you for watching tonight and God bless you.